Hello students, this video is being recorded in the summer of 2020, right after the end of the spring semester and in the midst of the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic. Since we do not yet know for sure what format our classes will take in the fall, and since there's some likelihood that at least some of us, both students and faculty, will have to be away from campus for a time should the mitigation plans prove ineffective or should compliance with or enforcement of public health guidelines prove impossible, I am preparing a video version of each of my lectures for the class to have it ready if and when it is needed. It's also the case that necessary distancing requirements in the classrooms may make it impossible that the entire class can be in the same room at the same time. In that case, those whose turn it is to stay away from campus may find these video lectures a better option than relying on a live classroom feed via Zoom or some other technology. So if you're watching this video, it means that we are, for reasons of public and personal health, still unable to meet together in a traditional face-to-face -face classroom format. All the same, I'll continue to do my best to teach you what I know with whatever tools I have at my disposal. Enjoy the lecture. <clears throat> Our next speech is from 1796, and it is a speech given in the United States House of Representatives by Congressman Fisher Ames of Dedham, Massachusetts, and it is his famous speech on the Jay Treaty. Ames was born in Dedham in 1758 and actually entered Harvard at the age of 12, graduating in 1774 at the age of 16. It was not as unusual as it may seem to enter college at a young age. As soon as you could pass the Latin entrance exam, you could be admitted to uh, the college curriculum. In 1781, Ames began his law practice, and in 1788, he was elected to the first federal Congress. Then he gave his famous speech in 1796 uh, on the Jay Treaty and died at the age of 50 on the 4th of July in 1808. The Jay Treaty was a treaty that President Washington uh, aimed to negotiate with Great Britain, uh, and to do that, he sent to Great Britain the Chief Justice of the United States, John Jay, and that's where the name of the Jay Treaty comes from. It helps to appreciate Ames's speech to understand some of the circumstances that existed and some of the issues that uh, President Washington wanted settled by the negotiation of a treaty of peace with Great Britain. So at the time that uh, Chief Justice John Jay is sent to Great Britain, Great Britain and France are at war. This is after the French Revolution, and now France and Great Britain are at war. But also, Great Britain, the British Navy, was seizing American ships that were trading with France in violation of free trade agreements. There were also blockades against American trade in the West Indies, not only with French ports in the West Indies, but even with British ports. There was also the case that the British Navy was impressing American sailors. They were taking American sailors off American ships and essentially drafting them or forcing them into the British Navy. Uh, British military outposts were still held in North America. There were outposts or forts in places like what is now Michigan and Northern Ohio uh, that even since the American Revolution were occupied by British soldiers. And so President Washington wanted those forts back so that they could be used to protect American settlement to the West as the United States expanded. Without those uh, forts in American possession, there was the continued threat of Indian attacks while the British controlled those territories, Indian attacks on American settlers. And you'll see this referenced 
in the Ames speech. Plus, there was a kind of general residual animosity uh, that still remained after the American Revolution. So in 1796, we are only 13 years from the peace treaty that ended the American Revolutionary War and only uh, 20 years since the Declaration of Independence. So there wasn't a lot of popular sentiment in favor of Great Britain among the American people. So when uh, Chief Justice Jay goes to Great Britain, he does negotiate a treaty, but of course keep in mind in the 18th century, it took about six weeks to travel from America to uh, England, and it was not possible to get daily news updates. So once Jay leaves America, he's essentially on his own to try to make the best treaty possible. And as it turns out, the treaty that he negotiates with Great Britain was not terribly favorable to the United States. Still, in his judgment and his wisdom, it was the best that the United States was able to get, which still allowed the United States to avoid going to war with Great Britain. So Jay's treaty was not very popular, especially when the articles of the treaty first became public. As you may know, uh, treaties under the United States, they're negotiated by the executive branch or by the president and the secretary of state, or in this case, by a special minister, John Jay. But then treaties must be ratified by the United States Senate. So as soon as the articles of the treaty were sent to the Senate for consideration, they were leaked to the press by treaty opponents. And once those articles of the treaty became public, there was widespread condemnation both of the treaty and of John Jay. And so uh, the treaty actually passes or is ratified by the Senate by exactly the two-thirds vote necessary. There was at that time only 15 states, and so the Senate divided um, the 30 senators 20 to 10 gaining the exact two-thirds majority necessary to ratify the treaty. However, there were certain articles of the treaty that required the United States to form some committees and also to expend certain amounts of money to put those articles of the treaty into effect. And because it required some spending, some federal spending by the United States, all spending bills go through the House of Representatives. They must, they must be introduced in the House of Representatives. So the House of Representatives, which had a majority of Democratic Republicans, the party opposite of Washington's Federalist Party, thought this was the opportunity that they could use to block the treaty, which they opposed. So they thought if they did not pass the required appropriations, that the treaty then could not go into effect. And so the Democratic Republicans in the House, led by Albert Gallatin and James Madison, among others, tried to block the treaty by refusing to appropriate the money necessary to execute the uh, components or articles of the treaty. So we see then Ames participating in this treaty debate in the House of Representatives. So one of the questions is, does the House, in fact, have any role in the treaty-making process? Under the Constitution, it's pretty clear they do not, but the House was trying to insert itself into the process where it did not constitutionally have a role to play. And then the other question is, should the House break a treaty which had been made by the President and ratified by the Senate, or would that be bad faith on the part of the United States. So these questions about treaty making, about the power of the House, these are deliberative questions. So Ames's speech is a deliberative address. So we can look at Ames's speech, which he gives on the 28th of April in 1796, and ask, as we do with the other speeches, what is the exigence, who is the audience, and what are the constraints? The exigence, obviously, 
is to get the House of Representatives to pass the necessary appropriations, that is to allow the treaty to go into effect and to prevent the breaking of the treaty, which would be perceived as an act of bad faith toward Great Britain and which would inevitably lead to war between Great Britain and the United States. The audience here, uh, first of all, there was wide attention paid to the Ames speech and to the debate in general in the House of Representatives. But the rhetorical audience here are the other members of the House of Representatives. They are the ones who could be persuaded by Ames's speech and who would have some power or authority to modify that exigence, that is to vote in favor of the necessary appropriations to put the treaty into effect. So the audience, the rhetorical audience, are the members of the House of Representatives. And the constraints here, well, there are many, but certainly among the more obvious ones is the wide uh, public condemnation of the treaty, the sense that popular opinion was against the treaty, um, the feeling by members of the House of Representatives that they were somehow being left out of a treaty-making process. So Ames needs to consider all of that in selecting both the material and the strategy he uses in the speech. So what are some of the critical questions that we can ask with regard to Fisher Ames's Jay Treaty Address? We could think about specifically the emotions that Ames appeals to, and we'll see him directly address some of these emotions in some of the passages, passages that we highlight uh, in a few moments. How does Ames encourage the House to judge the treaty? So you may recall when we read the Edmund Burke speech that one of the things that was going on was that Burke was demonstrating not only the argument, not only making arguments in favor of conciliation with America, but also demonstrating the proper method for deliberating and judging on questions like that. And a similar kind of thing is going on with the Ames speech because he's not only making arguments in favor of supporting the appropriations to put the treaty into effect, but he is also suggesting the approach or the strategy to be used in engaging in an act of deliberation and political judgment. And he is in, in effect demonstrating that while he's arguing in favor of the treaty. And one element of that is that Ames wants to encourage members of the House of Representatives to engage in imaginative reconstruction of what will happen if they um, break the treaty. So he encourages them to use their imagination and then to make a judgment about what they imagine about those consequences based not strictly on reason, but on emotion and passion as well. We can also think about then what faculties of mind uh, that Ames addresses. When we talk about faculties of mind, we're talking about the way, especially in the 18th century, that philosophers uh, imagined the human mind to work, that it possessed, that every human being possessed certain faculties. The faculties would be, for instance, memory and reason and the various passions, understanding, imagination, and the like. These are all things that human beings can do with their minds. And so what we notice in the Ames speech is that he takes this model of the human mind and kind of uses it as the foundation for the strategy that he has in addressing the members of the House. He asks them at different points in the speech to use a particular faculty to make a judgment. And so we want to pay attention to the way in which Ames addresses those various faculties of the mind as he speaks to the House of Representatives. And then I think it's important also to pay attention to and note 
the important figurative constructions in the speech. That is the places where Ames relies on various figures of speech and tropes as a way of um, expressing uh, his sense of what the key issues were in the treaty. And this relates to that question of faculties because when you're using figurative language, you are necessarily using a style of rhetoric which engages the imagination and the passion much more than you would if you were, for instance, just trying to inform or address the understanding. And you'll see that Ames makes these distinctions in the speech, and you'll see at those moments when he's using figurative language, that is metaphors and metonymy and synecdoche and other rhetorical tropes, that he's doing that at places where he wants the members of the house to arouse their feelings and passions and to make a judgment based on those feelings. And then I asked you to take a look at the article that I wrote now all the way back in 1990 on the Ames speech. And in this article, one of the things I try to do is to point out how Ames's strategy works. As it says, Early on in the article, the following analysis sets Ames's speech within the context of Enlightenment ideas prominent in the intellectual culture of the early American Republic. Indeed, we cannot fully understand Ames's oration until we grasp the philosophical and theoretical backgrounds upon which its strategy and appeals depend. So what I mean there is, again, in particular, this under this philosophical understanding of how the human mind works and especially how within the Scottish Enlightenment there were these models of the human mind that identified what the philosophers called the faculties of mind, imagination, reason, memory, passion, and the like. And so it's this understanding, this philosophical understanding of the faculties of the human mind that form the basis upon which Ames's rhetorical strategy works. And then one of the key questions in this philosophical debate was whether or not moral judgment, which would include political deliberation, so whether or not moral judgment was based on reason or instinct or passion, right? So on the one hand, there were some philosophers who thought moral judgment had to be based on reason and others who thought there was kind of an instinctive sense of feeling that told you when something was right or wrong. And so this uh, philosophical debate, again, enters into the deliberative debate in the House of Representatives. And we see Ames address that directly in his speech. As this second passage from the article points out, we can observe the practical importance of this dispute in the context of a common arena of public moral judgment. The realm of political de deliberation offers countless examples of moral decision-making and consequent political action. In Congress or Parliament, the question becomes how do representatives determine if a proposed action is right or wrong? After the debate, do they, as Robert Reed suggested, reason to their conclusion, or instead do they, as David Hume argued, feel the decision as a sentimental reaction? So this question about reason versus passion as the basis for moral judgment, this question not only occupied moral philosophers, but was central to Fisher Ames and the dispute on the Jay Treaty. And then finally, here's another passage which I think gets at one of the key points of the article. Comprehending the significance of the rational model of political judgment in late 18th century America helps us to reconstruct the political climate Fisher Ames faced in the Jay Treaty debate. Indeed, it becomes something of a constraint on Ames that the privileged model was the model of reason. That is, most people thought sound moral judgment had to be based on reason. And that's one of the constraints that Ames faces 
when he's going to recommend a strategy based on a different philosophical model. So Ames spoke to an audience predisposed to distrust the influence of passion in deliberation, and one quite aware that too often passions became the slave of sophistry. Indeed, Ames himself told a congressional audience in 1794 that a decision they faced then was a matter requiring the most circumspect inquiry and dispassionate judgment. But his approach to the Jay Tree debate in 1796 was remarkably different. So here's the key to understanding Ames' strategy. Rather than following the conventional model of judgment based on reason, Ames encouraged his colleagues to recognize the influence of passion and act on the basis of their feelings. So let's take a look at Ames's speech with these uh, questions in mind and see some of those passages where um, this strategy is obvious. So early on in the speech, toward the introduction of the speech, Ames says to his fellow members of the House, it would be strange that a subject which has aroused in turn all the passions of the country should be discussed without the interference of any of our own. We are men and therefore not exempt from those passions. As citizens and representatives, we feel the interests that must excite them. The hazard of great interests cannot fail to agitate strong passions. We are not disinterested. It is impossible we should be dispassionate. The warmth of such feelings may becloud the judgment and for a time pervert the understanding, but the public sensibility and our own has sharpened the spirit of inquiry and given animation to the debate. So there's two things in this passage that I think are worth noting. One is that you may recognize that Ames is using that language of the Scottish Enlightenment understanding of the faculties. So he's referring to the passions and the understanding here. And then he's also focused on the question of judgment and what are the influences on judgment. Certainly, the sort of um, prevailing uh, presumption is that good judgment should be based on reason. But Ames is saying here, when you think about it, that's unrealistic. This is a very um, tense debate. It is a, a debate about which there is wide and strong disagreement. Should we be surprised that there are passions involved? And so what he wants to do is acknowledge and recognize those passions. He wants to preserve those that are well-grounded, that is, those that are legitimate, but he also wants to calm and deflect those that don't have any solid ground for those strong feelings. But we see, them, uh, we see then that Ames introduces this language of the faculties and in particular introduces this idea that passion is to be part of the debate very early on in the speech. Then Ames turns to address this question of the role of the House of Representatives in ratifying or supporting a treaty. The question is, does the House have any legitimate constitutional uh, role in treaty making? Of course, Ames's position is that they do not, that if the treaty has been made by the President and ratified by the Senate, that the House has no choice but to follow through and vote the appropriations. But of course, there are others in the House who want to take this opportunity and by not supporting those appropriations, to in effect break the treaty because they disagreed or they uh, criticized the articles of the treaty. And so Ames wants to address this question about whether the House has some constitutional role in treaty making. And he refers to this again in terms of feelings or passions. And he talks about it as a jealousy of the House of Representatives. Jealousy in the sense that they're being left out or they're not being treated as equals 
with the Senate. But of course, if you read the Constitution, it's very clear that treaty making is the um, responsibility of the president with the advice and consent of the Senate. There is no role for the House of Representatives. But still, this is very early in the new American Republic. And so some of these questions haven't been clearly determined or decided yet, especially in their practical operation. And so Ames says to the members of the House, while these prepossessions remain, and what he's talking about here are the feelings about the House being left out or not being treated as an equal branch of government, he says, while these prepossessions remain, all argument is useless. It may be heard with the ceremony of attention and lavish its own resources and the patience it wearies to no manner of purpose. The ears may be open, but the mind will remain locked up and every pass to the understanding guarded. Unless, therefore, this jealous and repulsive fear for the rights of the house can be allayed, I will not ask a hearing. So you see in this first passage, Ames again invoking that language of the faculties, talking about the passions, talking about the understanding, and ultimately talking about judgment. But in this case, he's pointing out that if there are strong feelings, then argument is useless. That is, we cannot reach the understanding if there are strong passions in the way, especially if those strong passions are without grounds or without foundation. And this is the point he makes in the second passage here where he tells the members of the House, it will be impossible on taking a fair review of the subject to justify the passionate appeals that have been made to us to struggle for our liberties and rights. He means the liberties and rights of the House and the solemn exhortations to reject the proposition said to be concealed in that on your table to surrender them forever, meaning that the House has no grounds on which to feel that they're being left out of a process unfairly, indeed because it's simply a matter of what the Constitution has determined and what the Constitution says about the treaty-making power, that there isn't any grounds on which the House can have strong feelings of jealousy over the treaty-making process, that they have no proper grounds upon which to feel those strong feelings. And yet, as Ames points out, as long as those feelings exist, it will be hard for any orator to make an argument about it or to reach the understanding of his audience. And then Ames points out what is the essential question of the debate, that is, um, what are the deliberative options open to the House? He says, in the nature of things, there are but three. We are either to make the treaty, to observe it, or break it. It would be absurd to say we do neither. If, I may repeat a phrase already so much abused, we are under coercion to do one of them, and we have no power by the exercise of our discretion to prevent the consequences of a choice. By refusing to act, we choose. The treaty will be broken and fall to the ground. So the three choices here, either to make the treaty, to observe it, or break it. He's talking about making the treaty, that is to believe that the House does have some role in completing the ratification of the treaty. And he's already said, in effect, that that's groundless, that's a, that's a feeling that has no uh, solid basis to it. We could observe the treaty as it has been made by the President or the Senate, or by not acting, or by acting and refusing the appropriations, we could break the treaty. So these are the options open to the House of Representatives. And of course, Ames's position is that we must observe the treaty. That is, the House must follow through and vote in favor of the appropriations necessary to put the treaty into effect. So he asked the House, shall we break the treaty? 
And why does he raise the question in this manner? Because again, the majority of the House are Democratic Republicans and they oppose the treaty. And so Ames has to get around that constraint and persuade them, at least enough of them, to support the appropriations so the treaty will not be broken. He says, and again, notice here, he uses that language of the faculties um, to address this question. The language of passion and exaggeration may silence that of sober reason in other places. It has not done it here. The question here is whether the treaty be really so fatal as to oblige the nation to break its faith. A treaty is the promise of a nation. Now promises do not always bind him that make them, but I lay down two rules which ought to guide us in this case. The treaty must appear to be bad, not merely in the petty details, but in its character, principle, and mass. And in the next place, this ought to be ascertained by the decided and general concurrence of the enlightened public. So in effect, what Ames is saying here is, look, yes, there are some circumstances where it might be justified to have these strong feelings, these strong passions against a treaty, but that must be a case where the treaty is so obviously bad, not just a disagreement about this or that article, but it's so obviously bad and dangerous that there isn't any choice, that it must be broken. And he says, that would, that would appear obviously more so if the general enlightened public also thought that the treaty should be broken. And Ames's argument in this case is that neither of those conditions or criteria can be met. That is, the treaty is not so horribly bad that it must be broken and that general public opinion is not entirely against the treaty. And if we go ahead and break the treaty, it will involve us in shame. And so here's one of the um, passionate appeals that Ames makes. Certain feelings, like the feeling about the jealousy of the house, are without foundation. But here Ames is telling us, if you want to know what to do, that is, if you want to determine what's right and what's wrong, then consider the shame, that feeling that you would have if you broke the promise of the nation. And that feeling does have a solid foundation. So it should be the basis of the judgment that you make on this question. He says, this, sir, is a cause that would be dishonored and betrayed if I contented myself with appealing only to the understanding. It is too cold and its processes are too slow for the occasion. I desire to thank God that since he has given me an intellect so fallible, he has impressed upon me an instinct that is sure. On a question of shame and honor, reasoning is sometimes useless and worse. I feel the decision in my pulse. If it throws no light upon the brain, it kindles a fire at the heart. And so in this passage, perhaps more than in any other one in the speech, you can see Ames both invoking that enlightenment language of faculties. We have the understanding, reason, passion, all referred to here. And he's uh, suggesting that the judgment in this case ought to be made on the basis of feeling and not merely on the basis of reason or understanding. Understanding is too cold and its processes are too slow. The sure answer, he says, reasoning is sometimes useless and, and worse. I feel the decision in my pulse. If it throws no light upon the brain, it kindles a fire at the heart. That then becomes the basis upon which you should judge whether something is right or wrong. That is, it's that inborn instinct or moral sentiment, as it was called, in the 18th century philosophy. It's that moral sentiment that dictates uh, what our judgment should be on a question of shame and honor. And then he continues with this appeal to the passions by invoking the sense of sympathy. And by sympathy he means not merely feeling bad for someone else who's suffering, 
but to actually by imagination to put yourself into that person's position and then be able to judge from the perspective of that other person, then be able to judge what is right and what is wrong because you have sympathetically switched positions with that other person. And so Ames is telling the members of the house or encouraging them to do just that. And here again, he uses figurative language to arouse a strong feeling so that they understand what that feeling is and can properly make a judgment about what is right and wrong in this instance. So he says, on this theme, my emotions are unutterable. If I could find words for them, if my powers bore any proportion to my zeal, I would swell my voice to such a note of remonstrance, it should reach every log house beyond the mountains. I would say to the inhabitants, wake from your false security. Your cruel dangers, your more cruel apprehensions are soon to be renewed. The wounds yet unhealed are to be torn open again. In the daytime, your path through the woods will be ambushed. The darkness of midnight will glitter with the blaze of your dwellings. You are a father. The blood of your sons shall fatten your cornfield. You are a mother. The war hoop shall wake the sleep of the cradle. And though a little later on he says, On this subject you need not suspect any deception on your feelings. It is a spectacle of horror which cannot be overdrawn. If you have nature in your hearts, they will speak a language compared with which all I have said or can say will be poor and frigid. So a number of things about this passage. Again, we see Ames invoking that enlightenment philosophy of mind, of the faculties of the human mind, where we're referencing especially passions. We see also Ames telling the members of the house that it's on the basis of those feelings or passions that they must decide what's right or wrong. He says, don't suspect any deception on your feelings. Trust that natural instinct or moral sentiment within you to know what to do in this case. But notice also Ames is using figurative language here. He's uh, in particular, using the trope metonymy. And a metonymy is a substitution of something that's associated with the thing you want to describe. So, for instance, uh, sometimes we might hear um, the court ruled today or the White House uh, announced today. So the court or the White House aren't, actually aren't doing anything. Those are buildings or places. It's the people who work in the White House or the judge who rules in the court who's actually making the decision or making the announcement. But we substitute the building for the associated people who work in the building, and that kind of substitution is called metonymy. And that's what Ames is doing here, and he uses several of them in a row. Notice that he says, and he's talking about here the fact that there are settlers living in the western frontier or on the western frontier who will be in danger if America does not regain those military outposts from the British because they cannot be protected from Indian attack until those forts are in American hands. And so he's warning, in effect, uh, the people on the frontier and saying to them, the wounds yet unhealed are to be torn open again. And then a series of metonymies. In the daytime, your path through the woods will be ambushed. And of course, he doesn't mean actually the path, literally the path is not going to be ambushed. It's going to be the people, the settlers walking on the path who are going to be ambushed. And then he says, the darkness of midnight will glitter with the blaze of your dwellings. And, of course, that's an indirect way of saying your houses are going to be burned down, right? So the glitter, the blaze, is the indirect association of the fire that's burning your cabin. You are a father. The blood of your sons shall fatten your cornfield. 
Now notice how that's different. That's a figurative expression. Ames could have, could have said, you are a father. Your sons will be murdered by the Indians, right? But he doesn't say it directly. He says it figuratively. The blood of your sons shall fatten your cornfield. And the same thing, you are a mother. He doesn't say your babies are going to be killed, right? He says, you are a mother. The war hoop shall wake the sleep of the cradle. So we're required to use our imagination to see in our mind's eye the infant sleeping in the cradle who wakes up on the occasion of an Indian attack. Now this figurative language is designed especially to create a stronger emotional response. And Ames, of course, wants strong feelings here, and then he wants the members of the house to trust their feelings so that they know what the right choice, what the right vote is for the treaty. Then finally, this famous passage where Ames refers to the tomahawk, and sometimes the speech itself is referred to as the tomahawk address because of this image. But again, it's another figurative expression which helps Ames to arouse the strong feelings that he hopes will be the basis of a good judgment in favor of the treaty. He says, there is no mistake in this case. There can be none. Experience has already been the prophet of events, and the cries of our future victims have already reached us. The Western inhabitants are not a silent and uncomplaining sacrifice. The voice of humanity issues from the shade of the wilderness. It exclaims that while one hand is held up to reject this treaty, the other grasps a tomahawk. It summons our imagination to the scenes that will open. It is no great effort of the imagination to conceive that events so near are already begun. I can fancy that I listen to the yells of savage vengeance and the shrieks of torture. Already they seem to sigh in the western wind. Already they mingle with every echo from the mountains. So here again, Ames both using that language of enlightenment faculty psychology or philosophy talking about human mental faculties here the emphasis on imagination asking the members of the house to use their imagination to sympathetically place themselves in the position of the settlers on the frontier and then to judge based on the feelings that they have while using their imagination, right, to judge then whether they should reject the treaty. As one hand is held up to reject this treaty, the other grasps a tomahawk. And he's suggesting that the members of the House would have some guilt or some responsibility should settlers be killed in an Indian attack because they rejected the treaty. And all of that is done in the imagination of the members of the house. So he talks twice about imagination. He uses this term fancy, which here means simply, it's an 18th century expression, meaning the imagination. He says, I can imagine, in other words, that I listen to the yells of savage vengeance. And this is what he wants the members of the house to do too by imagination, to put themselves into that circumstance and then judge based on the feelings that they have sympathetically in that circumstance. So there's a review of Fisher Ames' uh, J Treaty Address. Um, and it's a longer speech, again, one of the longer ones we'll read this semester. We will read some shorter speeches, including the next speech, which is Jefferson's first inaugural. But I think if you have this understanding of Ames's strategy and are on the lookout as you read for these references to enlightenment psychology and the philosophy of moral sentiment, um, this idea of sympathy, looking for references to things like reason and understanding and passion and imagination, that you'll have a greater appreciation of the brilliance of Ames's speech. If you have any questions or comments about the speech, please post them to the discussion board.